go here to the second one, H3 intro. So and this is, is really short, but it gives you some, some interesting um, uh, feedback, sort of. So. So, and one thing that we come hopefully later to is um, tools like Kepler GL or, or other ones, Deck GL, they actually have um, as data types already, but this I, I can show uh, in the end. As a data type, you can actually have an H3 grid or a Google S2 grid. Yeah. So, and what you need for that, you would only, you only need the cell ID because this, as, as we've been explaining before, this contains already the location uh, and the resolution of those cells. And then you have some data values like elevation or here this is a land use code, precipitation, uh, like also um, how uh, Perry was also showing that you only need um, this ID and uh, this is sort of the highest resolution that you have available and going up to lower resolutions, you just aggregate based on the children's cells. Uh, you, you know which are the, uh, the parents because you go smaller. So all the ones, the parents of those, then you aggregate uh, and this way you can easily zoom across the, the, the scales. But yeah, the, 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 one of the interesting bits is really, you only have, this is the idea, this is, this is your geometry. This is your cell ID. This is your unique location on Earth and, and the resolution, meaning also sort of in a way a measure of uncertainty. Okay. This will hopefully start any moment. <coughs> If you have any questions, also put them either in the chat or keep keep notes. I'm keeping some notes for for the interesting discussion in the end when we can barrage the the experts with all the questions and their opinions. Why is DGS really useful, or how do GIS and DGS work together? What's the future? Will we not have ten thousand different projection codes anymore in the future? Go on. Get moving. Well, for the sake of that, I might always already start this one just in the background. faster okay here we go so this is now really meant as a, a really quick introduction at first only into uber h3 and um, so uber h3 has already made a couple of assumptions for their dggs system as i meant uh, mentioned and their main use case is really for their uh, of course their um, drivers management you know uber is you know the, the the taxi company so and and the idea is that they might have high number of requests people who are looking for ubers and then in another area they might have a high number of ubers sitting idle and here it's not so much the, the area statistics that they need but that they know the distances are comparable so in this way they can then decide um, to tell the Uber drivers where is the nearest sort of area where they will have more um, required uh, demand for pickups. So because you want to, of course, optimize the distance that the drivers have to drive and the amount of people that they can can service. So th this is that is basically um, this drive dispatching 
statistics management. This is basically the, the, the main use case for Uber H3. So, and um, you can either install it with PIP and it works on all platforms. Um, it's really, really smooth and it's super small. That is quite impressive. So here for Python, we do like this. We import H3 and here I'm just defining these three variables, let, long and the resolution. So, and uh, this would be somewhere in Estonia. And what we then do is we use H3 and then uh, here we now do everything programmatically cell based really on, we don't create all the cells at once, but we, because here we already know there's only one DGGS type. So all the data we are using will eventually be all in the same DGS type. So that's, uh, so here we really work only, you know, with those data points where we have data. So here we create uh, H3 ID based on the latitude, longitude and resolution. Yeah, so the, the, the point here is we create this ID and this is literally only a string. Yeah, this is only a string. And then this string, as I explained before, all the information is encoded. Yeah, so what we do now here, we do the otherwise conversion. Here's geo to H3 and here's H3 to geo based only on that string. So what we get back, we get um, the centroid of the actual cells. So the thing is here now, you see the values are not immediately completely identical. And that is because it's an indexing system, right? If you take any point and you put it into a DGGS, it will always go sort of be um, absorbed into this cell in which it is. But it, and only by specifying the level of resolution, you will keep your precision or accuracy. So in H3, if we, if we look here, the resolutions for H3, it's also sort of pre-calculated, but here they are really, you have to be obviously careful average area because we have seen, we have down to 0.6 or to plus 1.3 times of the area. So it's quite, quite rough. So we have resolution eight here. So it's sort of a couple of hectares still but already it would already be 700 million indices on, on the earth. Okay, so that's why this centroid of this cell is not necessarily the same number. The higher the resolution we make, we make 12, the closer, the closer we of course get to, to this point because the higher precision we, we, we zoom in, right? That's, that's sort of the premise, that's the logic behind it. Okay, and the next, next thing is then, this is the centroid of this cell and this is um, the boundary. This is the actual hexagon. Because one of the ideas is of course, if we work with uh, those DGS systems, is that we not, um, that we not have to carry all the big uh, geometries around, okay? But often enough for visualization, we still, our systems nowadays still mostly show that, you know, the way we need to work with it is, is still in our classic um, understanding until the software goes further. So this just shows that um, this is basically the order of points, GeoJSON order. So then we can make it uh, a polygon. And you see this, we just used a shapely geometry and we used the, the coordinate, um, list and here's interesting based on 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 the coordinate because if it's interpreted let long or lone lat that that's basically and if you reproject it in actually wgs84 you actually get some shape distortion as we meant uh, because it uses the gnomonic projection so you have a slight shape distortion so here in this case we use folium to to just look at some of those uh, some of those cells yeah? So also, as I said, in this string is also, the resolution is also encoded. And the next thing you can also ask is, um, uh, what's the parent, right? So the parent, because this to, um, library actually allows the, the traversal, that that's the important. Some of those things when we talk in the presentation before about topology and the hierarchical reliability, if you can properly traverse or not, 
those will be important for actual uh, GIS uh, spatial data analysis functions, right? So that's why. And if you then take the parent string here and ask that resolutions, it knows that it's um, already a, a higher resolution. Yeah. So then if we look here, we make a simple folio map. So this is for um, let's see, we can now also make several because this is a list. You can take this string, this string. And this is actually the parent here already. You see that the original one, this is a few hectares here. So this is Tartu by hometown. So this is a quite a small neighborhood. This is just a couple hundred meters back and forth. So this is not even a kilometer here almost, or maybe a almost maximum. And this is the small one. But you also see that they don't have the congruency, right? So you don't um, properly cover all of this. And another interesting thing is if you what you can do with, um, I think this also relates a little bit to Nick's question before. You can give it a polygon, and it will just fill uh, fill the polygon with the cells at the appropriate resolution. Uber has even another additional functionality where you can those cells, the central cells, it can be bigger in order not to waste so much space. Also, it can be compacted, so it will use bigger cells in the middle and smaller cells on the on the finer resolutions uh, to fill out the finer dif differences here. So this is um, basically here. Uh, la, la, la. Um, set to multi polygon. Polyfill. That that's the function here. Polyfill. Yeah. So you Jason, you give it a geometry. And, but uh, H3 always only works with WGS84 um, coordinate uh, lists. Yeah, so that's important in, in H3. Underlying, there, there's no other projected coordinates, and it's always um, that long. So, and you give it a polygon and the resolution, and it will fill this polygon with those numbers. And another interesting thing here is. K ring distances. So here we come towards something spatial data analysis. So H3, you take an index here and then you create the center coordinates. Again, this is here, this place here in Tartu. And here we um, want to now do some spatial analysis based on distance. So here it builds distances around, around at different, at different distances basically. And then it will be visualized in different. Um, so you can, it's basically like a buffer function in, in, in GIS. You, know, you make a buffer of so and so many rings because everything is based on the cells. There's not uh, nothing anymore in like your discrete units, how you would like it. <laughs> That's why those cells also don't have very nice uh, uh, diameters, for example, because it has to fit around the earth. So it's it's one reliable thing. So you don't get 100 meter or 50 meter resolution. You just get the resolution of of uh, of what fits actually around the Earth, and then at the next level, what the parents fit around the Earth. So you don't get nice numbers, but on the other side, actually, you don't need nice numbers because you have a perfect system. It's just that the kilometer circumference of the Earth is also not a nice number. It's something like 6,000. Oh no, it's a diameter. Uh, so you know that you don't have perfect numbers. But you can do a nice, elegant way of you know working with cell distances. So that's that that basic thing. So some of the basic things you can do with H3, and then here's one more advanced. Um, so this is the one that data layers. So here we come to the point where we actually see some data. And as you might have now getting to grasp, you have um, you have different um cells but as all the cells are now aligned and you are sampling or aggregating you know wherever your 
original observation data was um, within those cells, they are now made for each cell. So you can have, this is sort of your baseline raster. You don't have to align rasters anymore in order to, to do map algebra. So this here comes the raster analogy in so nicely. You don't, you don't have to align your rasters because the grid is already aligned. You just load the data into the grid and then you have all from the disparate data sources, the data along the same cells, and then you can do your analysis. So in this example is of course, ah, restart ah, quickly. Okay, so if you leave the notebooks uh, unused too long, they will the kernel will um, give away. Okay, so this is a classic one of those classic New York um, data sets, and here's a different data set. So the the raster thing I left out. I'll, I'll explain. I explained it before. This data source actually doesn't work anymore, and I didn't have the time to to prepare raster for New York. Um, so we have the census data, we have point data for complaints, and we have census track data. So and um, this data, those are the links. And then um, here's a bunch of functions. This is from Uber, as an example, to to just load data in. So I can I can give you some um, examples. So one of the things what they do here, which is clever, is they use scatter plotting, because once we have a couple of thousand or tens of thousands, not to speak of hundreds of thousand, uh, polygon vector geometries, uh, plotting those with um, tools like GeoPandas or other geo libraries becomes a super pain because it still has to do all the, you know, even though they're super fine detailed, um, the, the full geometries, which is really sort of um, overkill. So what they do is they take the centroids and just do a normal scatter plot which we can still do like, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions. So that is a pretty clever, particularly if you have a really high resolution, you get actually a really smooth picture and you only need to make a dot. Then one thing here is uh, then um, downscaling. So that's when you go from a high resolution children grid with data to the next higher level. Then of course, each seven children, you have to aggregate um, for the data for the parent. So and of course, this is a pandas group by by the parent, and um, you need to get the parent, and uh, then it's the group by, and then they take this the let longs out again in order to do the scatter plot. So it's actually pretty straightforward. And then this is not krieging; <laughs> it's a k ring. So and, um, basically, this is based on the rings. So how many rings? This is basically sort of a bit of a inverse distance weighting um, sort of smoother in interpolation. You take how much of the distance you want to have influence and between those you're sort of smoothing the values in order to um, take out extreme values. Also to possibly um, show the overall spatial pattern a bit better. And this is just an additional weighted um, version of the same algorithm. Okay, so the first thing here is they load the data. It's just CSV data. And you do a normal hex plot, a uh, scatter plot. If you want, what we can do is here, because it's just a simple panda data frame, we can do something like this sample three just to see the general information. Um, this is how it looks. It's literally only that long. And this is because it's noise complaints. Each of those is a single event. Yeah, so each event doesn't itself doesn't have a magnitude like temperature. It's just counting of the events. Um, we can do also info, and you see you have um, hundred thousand hundred thousand values. So and then you want to load this point data into our hex grid, right? So because we have these already as points, for each of those, like I showed before in the intro, we'll now do the geo2h3, so the let long um, into, uh, into a hex ID. So here's we give which resolution we are thinking about, because we know the resolutions based on, on uh, um, specification. 
Okay, so for all of these, they will also now be hexified. And um, of course, because the, the many might be in the same cell, it will be a group by in order to only get um, the numbers for the same cell. We only need one cell, but we want to know how many, which is count. Yeah, so the group by will basically take, if you have 10 noise complaints in the same area that are covered by the same cell, this, the group by by the cell ID, because the cell ID for those is the same, and it will then be a group by and then just count the results. There's a normal data frame operation. There's no space, there's no spatial computation uh, necessary. So that's why those, those things are well parallelizable. So, and then we just um, have our new hex count. And then for those, we just take the let longs out again. And then they do a scatter plot against the count. Yeah, and it's just a normal scatter plot. So when you see there's um, the count complaints per grid cell. So now you can start doing your spatial analysis. It's almost like a heat map already, right? We have already a density map. This is exactly what it is. And if you are interested how this thing looks like again, then we can do our newly created data frame. And again, we can say info. We want to see in comparison. Now it's only five, only 5,000 cells. If we would take higher resolution, then we would get, of course, smaller counts because you know, we have smaller resolution. Um, but we also have much more points. So this here, then a histogram. You see most are actually under, 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 100, under 100. And we have a few extreme values here. Maybe it's the Bronx. Actually, I'm not sure. Queen. <laughs> I don't know exactly the topology of uh, topography of New York. And here would be Manhattan, though. OK, so now the space is smoothing. So as you can see right now, it's still a bit hard to see this, um, some nice spatial detail because we want to see the general pattern, sort of. So in this um, smoothing with two ring, two ring distance, yeah? so two additional cells to consider. So, and uh, if we run that, that will take a moment. And you see compared, so we have now some more points. The plot here looks a bit um, denser though. And here you can really see the two ring distance around, around this original yellow bunch here. And here we can now see, but we see also now it's in a way it's also like a normalization, like a reclassification. We could use, you know, Python, Python map classifier in order to get some more speaking classes in order, because here we basically don't see any other patterns really. We only see some extreme ones here and here. But now with the smoothing, we can see some, some general pattern. If you now look at the histogram, the histogram is now um, also a bit a bit easier. Doesn't have so many extreme values anymore. Okay, so this uh, this is of this is actually a very typical minimal approach already. You take some data and uh, you sample it into the grid, and from there you have a reliable frame of reference. And all the data you want to use to compare with it, you also load it to this. And because you can do basically cell ID with the values, you can do direct already your, your map algebra or your, your statistics. So here's another um, approach. Um, also Nick asking <laughs> again about polygons. Um, so we would have a um, polygon data set. Polygon is a shape file um, with the boroughs and um, it will be read in, will be merged um, with our other data frame. And no, wait, um, because it has a, a CSV file with some additional data, right? Uh, so this is, let me check. 
we have um, data uh, and uh, per, per census. And we have the census polygons and we have some census data, but the census data is um, in CSV form and has to be linked to the polygon outline. That's a typical approach actually. Um, okay, so let's do this, this first. It will load the data here um, and it will join them based on the borrow ID. And you can see now those are actually separate polygons. Yep. So if you want to see our um, our data frame, we can do here again info. We have two thousand one hundred, and um, we have those fields here. So um, now the census polygon to the hex. So now we have our, um, actually we could here do something like this. Sample, we wanna see five samples. So we have um, the polygon geometry. So it's not point geometry. So we can't actually just immediately sample it. So what, um approach is taken here is um, at first it makes it again a geopanus data frame then um it will make a union polygon so it will be making it makes it one big polygon it's joint stem and um it will fill this overall polygon yeah, so this is like an outline of the whole, of all the polygons. And then it will use this H3 polyfill to fill this outline with lots of small polygons, with the actual hexagons. Then it will make uh, a data frame from the, um, from the hexagons that, that you got out, because hexagons, right now we only get, get again the IDs only, because we only need to work with IDs. Then we take again the let long coordinates and make it a point geometry. And uh, then you make a normal geo um, pandas, basically a spatial join. So we create, this is a typical way also what I explained before of, of, of sampling data. You create the cells that would fill the area. It could be for Rasta or for here polygon. And then you take the centroids and it, with the centroids of your grid, you poke at your data and sample, extract the, the data points. And then you have the data values for your, your, um, for your hexagon or for your DGGS. This way you load typically the DGS data. So this is something we can also focus a little bit in the discussion later, which are you know, some accuracy or precision uh, considerations when loading raster or vector data into a DGS system. So the beauty of the DGS system is, of course, uh, that you have this unified grid where you can do map algebra because all the cells are obviously aligned. You can also easily go from parents to children. Um, but when you sample from raster into a DGS or from polygon into a DGS, of course, intuitively we as GIS people would say we might lose some of the original information because the you know the polygon is not exactly representing it's like rasterization of a polygon it all depends on the res resolution and you still don't get the you know perfect polygon outline this uh, philosoph philosophical question that we can totally um, discuss later <laughs> okay so so we have now created our data. You see through the um, through the spatial join, we have our hex ID and um, we have the information. I think this is the data, the actual data points here. So, and then we make, a, this is just the data frame and now we make a data plot against uh, the, so now wait, quick, what's the metric call? Yeah, this is the data column. Exactly, that's what I meant. Sorry, this is the data column. So that's why um, 
this is the information that we actually want to look. So we make a, a, now a, again a, just a normal scatter plot with this let long. So you can see here let long just normal scatter plot. So let's run that. And then again, sort of this is now because this is resolution ten, it's uh, quite fine. And um, again, you can do the spatial smoothing. So let me quickly um, is that also noise. What is the census? I think it's what population statistic that actually was. So the spatial, the smoothing again. So this will take a bit longer. Also, you can see we have to keep an eye on the memory. So there's different um, sort of coefficients how it, it wants then eventually, eventually smoothing it. Because here we are still having the original um, polygon boundaries, which might or might not be fully representative. That's why a higher resolution sampling and then a, a smoothing again in order to have it more like a make a heat map. So this would take a while. You can see our memories climb. Population density, of course. Uh, population density. Here's a population density per sort of you know enumeration unit, which is the boroughs, which is like a district. But if we want to look at the uh, more natural, likely natural way, so of course that the population density doesn't exactly stop at that boundary, right? That might already be a bit lower um, before but it might still be a bit higher after. Yeah, and so if I'm... Yeah, no, it's still more. <laughs> But you have to consider, I mean, this is now, the interesting bit is, um, this is actually a function on a, on a purely, on a purely tabular basis. There's no, the, the only spatial aspect is that, um, based on the, um, smoothing here, it's basically we just, it's like a merging and then it's a group by again, and it's just looking based on the rings, but the ring is just uh, is just another selection method, yeah. So so it's not. Uh, here we go. Eight hundred max. Oh, that was okay then. So the interesting bit here is um, that that this type of spatial calculation is actually completely, almost completely um, aspatial. And at least in terms of how it's expressed in the computer. And this way, it suddenly makes it uh, uh, easier to deal with on, on a large scale. Yeah, because um, you, can, you can distribute it, partition it into different areas. Uh, you can just chop it into pieces. Um, and, and, it, and you can also just store it also without uh, other spatial reference. So there, this this is some of those things that the GGS people keep sort of reiterating over that it, it has some of those advantages. It, it all goes back down to computational efficiency. So this is now nicely smoothed, and now for for statistics because actually we don't really know the um, the truth so much. Um, the idea is now because this is resolution ten. This resolution ten is just going up up the chain again, sort of. So this is now really fast. And then if you go one more up, then, I mean, this is still for a decision maker, you know, this is, or for a quick overview, 
this is still a quite easy view on in which areas of New York you have higher population density. Of course, this looks really nice, but um, it does actually not give more information, for example, than this, right? But this is, you know, uh, all about, again, precision and, 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 and uncertainty. And this is what uh, DGS and SOFA also makes interesting that based on the different resolutions, you're not, um, you're not um, sort of saying you're less precise, but it's just the cells are bigger. That just means the data that the cell represents also has a larger uncertainty because it's a larger area that, in which that value is valid, right? The further you go down, the more you, you um, give the, give the, um, the, how to say, the guarantee that the values is within that cell. That, that's just the whole point. If we do with our mobile phone, say my GPS position is here, we know that there's at least two, three meters, which is nowadays, which is great, but still two, three meters um, accuracy, you know, issues. And uh, so having a cell that does not say you're right within half a square meter, but you're right within two or three square meters is totally appropriate because we cannot say if even if the GPS position that we get is a point, the point is just not there where, where it says it is because we know that it could be two meters in each direction. So this is, this is something in terms of, of uh, sort of acknowledging if we have those cells, those cells that are all over the globe, the larger, the smaller the cells are, that it's just also a matter of the representation of the uncertainty, sort of. Okay, 